Boo! Okay, now that I got those two celebrations out of the way, let's get on with the video. Alright, so after pulling a 7 hour blast to get that airy double feature out, and dealing with lots of other life stuff, I've returned to find out we've hit 50 subs! So that may be small compared to YouTube standards, but I think it deserves to be noticed, so big hand out there for all my viewers and subs. Thank you, everyone. But enough chit-chat. I've got an interesting topic for today's video, which is the Celestial Realm Theory. It's basically been confirmed by this point after the events of Bravely Second, but I wanted to make this because A. It's just plain fun to talk about, B. Some people may not understand it completely or not know about it at all, and C. I might point out some things here and there you may have not noticed or forgotten. Now here's your spoiler warning for both Bravely Default and Second, and I mean really spoiler heavy. If you don't care or have heard about this but don't quite understand it though, or are just still interested in watching, watch on. Okay, so in the Bravely series there's a backstory on something called the Celestial Realm. So we'll go over that first. What is the Celestial Realm exactly then? Well, we'll need to go back to default to start this story. Lord Aroboros, the final boss of Bravely Default, his main goal was to invade the Celestial Realm, which he claimed was a place that was filled with love and benevolence, or kindness, a world that knew no war or strife. During the final phase of his boss fight, he calls out and says that he can see the Celestial Realm within his grasp. Little fun fact that you may or may not know, there actually is one enemy in particular that is from the Celestial Realm, the light-type dragon from the vampire job questline, Shinryu. Or Shinryu, I don't know. So what does the Celestial Realm look like? We're going to get to that in a bit. The next major mention of the Celestial Realm is in Bravely Second, where we have to clear away a large cluster of dark clouds at the Norende Ravine in order to enter, via Celestio, the road to the Celestial Realm. Again, I will get into what that looks like in a bit. And finally, Lord Providence claims to be the god of the Celestial Realm. So what we have is a world filled with kindness and light that seems to exist separately from Lux and Dark, but it still has its connections. So now that we have a basic understanding of what the persons of Lux and Dark think of the Celestial Realm, just a realm of the gods, let's talk about its residents. Celestial beings, like their world, are referenced multiple times throughout the games. In default, both Mephelia and Aurobras reveal that Tiz houses a Celestial within him, but Tiz lets the Celestial free after the ending of default. Providence also pokes at another Celestial during his boss fight. Alright, I get it, enough with the being vague act. So what or who actually is a Celestial being? It's you. You, the one watching this video, the one playing the games, is the Celestial being. Which means the Celestial Realm is our world. Proof? Sure thing. We have to jump all the way back to the very start of default once again though to explain this. When Tiz ends up as the lone survivor after Nurende is swallowed up by the Great Chasm, he should technically be dead. But the player ends up entering his body and giving him life once more. You are basically using Tiz as a vessel throughout the game's entirety, guiding the party along to their destinies. Now, Tiz isn't aware of our presence, as he appears to believe that the decisions are being made solely by himself. Mephelia and Aurobras, again, make him more aware of this fact eventually, but he doesn't really do anything about it. Until the end of default, which is where I'm going to play a guilt card on anyone watching this. So prepare to feel terrible, everybody. At the end of default, Tiz gives up the celestial being inside him and falls into a coma for two years. Until Bravely Second begins. Kinda funny that it also took two years for the second game to actually come out in our world, huh? Here's what I'm getting at. It is our fault, the player's fault, that Tiz went into a coma. We beat the game and stopped playing, so Tiz didn't have a celestial being anymore, and therefore was empty once again, until we returned to play the sequel two years later. Good, good, good work everyone. We made Anya sad together. That's, that's great. Thanks, Square Enix. But enough guilt tripping. We do come back in second, but this time we aren't directly affecting Tiz. This whole story, by the way, is confirmed by Bravely Second's opening act, with the movie and Deneb narrating. Now we are following you, Jenny Olja, and act once again as an outside will. You admits to feeling this will, unlike Tiz, and actually talks to the player in two different instances. The first was to ask the player to bring them back through time, that being us creating a new game plus and restarting the story. 
The other is during the absolute best cutscene in either game, not to mention the most literally fourth wall breaking thing I've ever seen. Yu speaks to the player, trying to encourage them, along with all other characters in the game, and that was just really, really awesome. Providence also directly interacts with the player during the fight, telling the party about how we take amusement in watching them suffer. And then the son of a gun tries to make us go and delete our own game data. Can't forget about the camera moments either. Remember me mentioning the last phase of Ouroboros and the Narende Chasm in Bravely Second? Well, during both of those moments, the front camera will turn on and will show the player's face, re revealing the fact that our world is indeed the celestial realm and we are the celestial beings. If you still don't believe it or understand or want more, I've got some more info on this. The next bit of information is going to focus on summoning, and then we'll talk about a few more connections some characters and places have to this story. Mephelia is the summoning asterisk holder, and is one of a handful of characters with connections to the Celestial Realm. The beasts she can summon are actually Celestial Beasts from our realm, which makes sense. Suzano O is a giant warrior that uses power line towers as sword. Deus Ex is literally a clockwork spider. These come from our world and enter into the mystical world of Luxendark as these creatures. Mephelia, once again, is also the first person to make notice of Tiz housing the celestial being. This idea also applies to summoning friends. Worlds, quote unquote, in the Bravely universe, are simply just other players' copies of the games. Now let's get into some other characters that I haven't mentioned already that are also connected. Anya's is a bit of a big one. The Angel, in default, calls her a Child of the Celestial Light. This is probably due to her abilities as a Vestal to pray to the Crystals, or rather, call to us, the Celestial Beings. Now, how about Altair? He is apparently from the Celestial Realm, along with Vega and most likely Deneb, the Adventurer. That would technically classify him as a Celestial Being. He does reference research that he was doing in the Celestial Realm and all these different uh, events like Acidic Rain. You see spaceships forming in the background. So maybe it's an era of humanity when we are exploring space or we have an even greater scientific development. I mean, he also did possess Tiz, just like we did, so... And lastly, we get to Providence. I had to talk more specifically about this guy than some of the other characters. Providence is from the Celestial Realm, which makes him a Celestial Being, and claims to be our god. During the fight against him, in Phase 1, the background shows power lines and a city. Since Via Celestia leads to the Celestial Realm, this shows that the party is very close to entering our world. When Phase 2 starts, apart from the clouds, the background is exactly the same as the main menu to the game, so now they're even closer to breaking out of our 3DSs. Then the False God starts taunting us and trying to turn the party against us, telling them all about how we've controlled their actions over the course of the journey, and that we take great pleasure in watching them suffer and get KO'd over and over, and plant their faces in the ground. <laughs> uh, oh and then he tries to delete our game data. But is anyone aware of what Providence represents? Yes, I know, Illuminati confirmed, haha, we've all made that joke already. He even has a stinking move called New World Order. But think a little more seriously about it. He could be the embodiment of government, saying that we live in this realm, and he rules it as a god, and controls our every move. That's possible. But another idea is in combination with the first form as well. That is the form of a bird. That's right, is money the true source of despair? I'll let you think about that. Though, I don't really think Ouroboros got the memo since he thinks our world knows no strife. Or war. In any case, those are my main examples I have on the Celestial Realm backstory. I am very, very happy that Square Enix did this kind of thing. Very, very cool on their part to actually include the player into the storyline and I can't wait to see what kinds of crazy things they'll do in the next game for this. But that'll be all for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and another shout out for the 50 plus subs. I'm very happy about that. If you guys have any other questions about this video or any videos you may want to see in the future, leave me a comment down below and I'll take a look. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.